All right, welcome back, everybody. In this lecture, which, oddly enough, is going to be the last lecture for the class, what we're going to be doing is continuing down our journey of exploring different types of mental health disorders. And in this one, we're going to be looking at, much like a number of other ones we've discussed previously, a very important topic, a very important category of disorder, especially when we look at people of college age, what we call substance abuse disorder. Just for some context as to why this is such an important topic and why many intro to psych instructors have decided to focus on this as the last topic covered in their classes, I thought we'd look at some numbers highlighting just one of the type of substances that people have been known to abuse over the last not only a couple decades, but in all reality, last couple centuries. It's this broad categorization of substances that we call opioids. Now, if you take a drug in the brains class, you'll learn about the classifications of opioids and what make them chemically different from things like depressants or excitatory drugs. Uh, but just understand when we're looking at opioids that it's a very highly addictive classification of drugs that can have very robust effects on the individual, both psychologically and physically. Now, opioids are not relatively new, but specific types of synthetics where we have found ways to derive specific com chemical combinations to make them all the more effective and in doing so also all the more addictive have become much more prominent over the past decade or so. And what we've seen is that as these synthetics have become more powerful, we've gone from just a few people dying of an opioid overdose in the population each year, found in the United States at least, to over 10 individuals now per 100,000 that die each year. You know, looking at that on a grand scale, since we have over 300 million individuals in our population, what we're looking at is roughly 30,000 individuals in the population dying per year of some type of drug overdose, usually with some type of opioid-related death. And these trends, though they've leveled off from what you see in the chart, are at astronomical levels if we compare where we were just a couple decades ago. And this really highlights not only the changes that have happened chemically to opioids and other types of drugs that many people commonly use, but also the need for a clinical psychologist to get on top and, and define and, and figure out ways to help individuals with these types of substance abuse disorders. Again, just to reiterate, opioids are just one of many different types of uh, drugs that are out there. Um, and, and just, again, to clarify, there's 110 people per 100,000 that are dying, and we have 300 plus million individuals in the population. You have to multiply that number of 10 by 3,000, which gets us to 30,000 deaths per year just from opioids. Um, and obviously, we, we get much higher than that for all drugs that are used each year. It's definitely a problem. And it's something that needs to be addressed. So how are we going to address it? How are we going to talk about this topic in a class like this? Well, first, we're just going to define what substance abuse disorders are. And we're going to tie it very closely to this concept that we call addiction disorders. We'll define not only addiction, but also the components of addiction, like tolerance and withdrawal. Then we're going to talk about different types of issues when it comes to trying to get people off of these drugs. In particular, we'll talk about dependence issues, both physical and psychological. And at the very end, we'll talk about some of the treatment paths that have been explored by clinicians when trying to not only address drug issues as a whole, but just address all types of uses of drugs that exist in a variety of different forms. So let's first, as we usually do, just start by defining what this disorder is in the DSM. When we're looking at drug abuse issues, 
what we're looking at is what we call a substance related disorder substance use disorder there's a lot of different things that go into defining somebody's having substance use disorder in fact we're going to look at those in the next slide but as an overarching thing what we're looking at when somebody has some type of substance use issue is that their cognitions their functions and their their body are being dramatically impacted by the continuous use of a substance and they're continuing to use those things even though they're usually overtly aware of these impacts usually this substance use disorder classification is kind of under the umbrella classification of what we call addictive disorders uh, usually we talk about d d substance use disorders when looking at drugs because it's kind of a narrow thing that we're discussing addictive disorders kind of grabs at a large number of impulse control issues that people can have which can relate to things like gambling or other types of impulsive behaviors that people do want to try to overcome but can't necessarily do it the, the substance use one is the one where we're looking at the harm that's coming as a byproduct again of the use of specific types of substances that somehow alter the mind and body so what else can we then use to define substance use disorder what are the things are clinicians looking for to diagnose somebody with this well one of the things that's really critical to first identify is whether or not somebody is having certain aspects of their lives physically impaired as a result of the substances being taken you know, many individuals in society partake in alcohol and other types of drugs on a semi-regular basis and many times while they're taking these things they can find themselves you know, impaired but it doesn't necessarily qualify these individuals as having substance use disorder what really puts people past the threshold and again we're not talking about people that break versus not break it's usually some type of continuum and we draw a line in the sand when we say individuals are kind of past this point if they're often finding themselves taking much more than they intended to and these things that they're doing while taking these are causing problems and unfortunately for these individuals they recognize these problems but are not capable because of their cravings or desires to use these things to do away with the use of the drug despite their recognition of these kind of impairments that these things are causing now this oftentimes is not just related to the times when they are using these chemicals another thing that's really critical for defining somebody's having substance use disorder is that these things carry over into other aspects of life where the ability to say be successful in school work or just maintain your duties at home starts to become very challenging because of the, the constant use and the constant need to pursue this substance that you are becoming addicted to um, there's also lots of research that suggests that just having issues within relationships that constantly revolve around drugs can be sufficient even if we're not necessarily looking at a family dynamic or other types of responsibilities that we typically look at when diagnosing somebody with this substance use disorder another thing that's a very big tell and whether or not somebody could be diagnosed with it is whether or not these things are not just impacting work but putting them in situations where they are much less safe due to the constant need to pursue and or use these drugs uh, usually one of the, the big telltale signs is when people can't stop using drugs long enough to kind of get successfully from point a to b say in a car or they have major physical impairments that are a problem yet they still feel this inherent need to continue using these drugs um, say for example you I don't know are, are having issues with your weight or you're having some type of heart issue and yet you still feel this big need or even right before a surgery you, you still feel this big need to utilize these drugs knowing that there could be toxic side effects to it or, or big problems as a result of these things and if these are the typical things that we look for that, that really are indicators that this is not just somebody using drugs recreationally this is somebody that has an issue with drugs and can be defined again as having some type of substance use disorder 
for looking at how this really changes the body, there's two other really big pharmacological terms that are discussed in this clinical area, and what we call tolerance and withdrawal. We'll break these down now as we progress. So what is tolerance when we talk about substance abuse issues? Well, tolerance is all about this kind of increased need for stronger and stronger doses of whatever the chemical you're becoming addicted to is in order to experience the same exact effects as you originally had. Now, this was my in-person class. I would draw on this, well, any board that's in front of us, this chart that shows kind of the experiences and euphoria and, and pleasantness that people experience, usually at least report experiencing when they take drugs, this drug that they can be eventually become addicted to for the very first time. And what typically happens for these individuals is they take a drug, they get this huge spike, and we'll talk about the, the brain pass related to it a little bit later. And after they have that huge spike, they go back down to normal. After the second or third time they start taking these drugs, the spike, if they're just taking these drugs at the same level, is still there, but it's significantly less. And this is an indicator of increased tolerance. The other thing that we can display in this chart is the fact that when people often come down after several uses of these drugs, they don't come back down to just the status quo or the level they were at originally. Instead, they tend to dip considerably below that original level. Now, in the beginning, many people can pull back to a typical normal, in their minds, normal level and functionality and of feeling. After a while has passed and they've kind of come off this withdrawal of the drug, but for people that start getting themselves addicted to these drugs, these withdrawal symptoms can become much, much, much more robust and they can last much longer to where people start getting themselves to a point on these cycles where they're simply taking these drugs to get themselves to highs that are more indicative of where they were before they were using the drugs in the first place. And the lows that they can experience if they're not maintaining themselves on these drugs, these withdrawals, can be so painful that it can almost feel like you're dying or that you need to consume these chemicals, however they are, or something bad, really bad, is potentially going to happen. And, and when this cycle starts to pop up, what you're seeing really is a telltale signs of addiction in a variety of different forms. What are these forms then when we talk about addiction? How do we know when somebody's feeling dependent? Now this chart that we would look at in class really highlights the impact of what we call physical dependence on specific drugs, where certain mechanisms within the brain and chemicals that these structures are using start to highly kind of require the drug for them to function at a level that they were functioning at before the drug was introduced into the person's system. Not at that moment, but long, long ago. This tolerance withdrawal process is not just a mental thing. When we look at it at the physical level, we're gonna, in the next couple slides, kind of break down some of the structures of the brain that are required, well, not required, but important components to the growth of physical addiction that happens for many individuals getting themselves into these substance use disorders. But it's also important to note that while these physical changes are happening to the body and we start to go through certain types of withdrawal that we'll talk about next, there's also psychological components tied into it as well. And these psychological components are both chemical and mental in nature. When we talk about craving these drugs, we're talking about the brain altering, getting shifted in different directions. But when we talk about the brain altering, we have to appreciate that changes in neurotransmitter levels, which is a byproduct of changes in the functionality of the brain, are also the equivalent of changes in the mind. So when we feel a lack of something in our mind, like we need a specific drug or we're, we're feeling experiencing pain and cravings, and that's really a byproduct of the changes that are happening physically. So it's not just the brain changing and being in these states that, that cause the body to start to, to kind of alter if the drugs aren't being used. 
It's the mind and trying to find a way to satiate the needs of several components of our nervous system to kind of find a way back to normal after these drugs have really wreaked havoc on the body and created high degrees of tolerance and withdrawal experiences. But what are some of the physical symptoms that people experience that go beyond just the brain shifting? Well, for alcohol, one drug that's very commonly used by people who develop substance abuse issues, their experience without alcohol when it comes to withdrawal can manifest itself in a variety of different ways. Many individuals report feeling nervous or uncomfortable and shaky if they're not using alcohol, but that's certainly not the only thing that can happen when people start to experience withdrawal symptoms in alcohol. In fact, some of them are sort of counterintuitive. Alcohol being kind of an inhibitory thing overall, shutting down different parts of the brain through the activation of a specific type of neurotransmitter called GABA, or cells that use a neurotransmitter called GABA, um, which is actually something that shuts off parts of the brain. So it's a weird path that you can learn about if you take a drugs in the brain class. Um, it would suggest that not consuming alcohol would actually be something that would give you energy and maybe make you feel better. But what we actually see when people start to experience some of the withdrawal symptoms is that they actually report feeling more and more tired and more and more depressed and more and more anxious as a result of not having alcohol within their system. And, and, and these physical symptoms, again, really highlight how once certain components of the brain are impacted, it, it, it expands to large other swaths of the body that are kind of interconnected with our nervous system in unusual ways and can create sort of unpredictable side effects. And this is true just for alcohol, but it's also true for, I guess it's true not just for alcohol, but it's also true for pretty much every type of drug that could potentially be addictive. What is it then that causes the addiction? What is it that gets us to a point where we, we, we need to crave these drugs? Mentally, when people talk about being addicted, they talk about really loving a specific drug, needing that drug, and feeling like if they don't have it, then something's not right. If we're looking at kind of the, the, the cellular level and where this is coming into play, what we tend to see is there's a structure within the brain that we're going to talk about next called the nucleus accumbens that when these drugs are taken goes nuts. And in particular, it goes nuts through the use of a specific type of neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is also tied to things like the amygdala and the hippocampus. When we take these drugs, this kind of cascade of activity that produces this huge release of dopamine has been tied to this kind of positive, pleasurable feeling and this increased obsession with finding ways to sort of recreate this change that's happening both within the brain and the corresponding body. And that area of the nucleus accumbens is a place I do want to pay extra close attention to because there's lots of research that's been going on over the last couple decades or so that's focused its attention on how critical this structure and the connecting structures of the amygdala and the frontal lobe are to the development of lots of substance use issues that go beyond just this being a disorder and get into just kind of addiction in general. We know that these areas have been critical components to us being able to survive throughout history. And when good things happen, when wonderful, pleasurable things occur, these areas are designed for us to kind of grab at them and find the code within to try to replicate that in the future. You know, and historically, for human beings, this was a very advantageous thing. Right? Having something that quickly recognized when we found food that was good for us, you know, how to recreate that when we found a face place that was safe was, was extremely valuable. But now that food is in abundance, at least for most people, and that safety is not necessarily a primary issue, again, for most people, 
if the nucleus accumbens is still working, but it's now searching for other things that are considered pleasurable, and it starts to pursue things that maybe are temporarily pleasurable, but not necessarily good for us over the long run. And trying to figure out a way to, to kind of decode this system and try to find a way for people who've had this system get thrown off as a result of the use of substances has been a, a kind of an endeavor for lots of neuroscientists and people looking at this disorder in particular. And what makes this interesting, or at least all the more interesting when we look at the science around this particular topic, is that uh, many people have started to recognize that when we use these drugs, it's not actually the drug effects themselves that produce some of the neurological responses that people experience and, and kind of make these things addictive overall. What numerous studies have shown is that many people who struggle with addiction don't just become addicted to the substance themselves, they come addicted to the things surrounding those substances. So for people with alcohol issues, they become addicted to just the, the, the environment of bars and other social places where alcohol is consumed regularly. For people with addiction to marijuana, they become addicted to this specific substance because of specific groups that they are a part of or things that they do, routines that they engage in before they consume that specific drug. And this is true for heroin users, cocaine users, large groups of people who find their substance of choice and become addicted to these things tend to not just become addicted to the drug, but they tend to become addicted to the process. And to understand this, there have been neuroscientists that have set up very ingenious designs to kind of explain where in the brain this transition starts. One of the more classic studies that examine this, which would be one that we'd actually watch a video on in class and listen to for about 10 or 15 minutes. Again, can't really do that in this lecture. Is this study that was done by a researcher named Duick, where they had monkeys in a lab do these different activities after they saw specific cues on a screen. And by doing these activities, they would get juice. Well, after a while, well, sorry, let me clarify. So they, they would do these activities, get a reward of juice, and their brain, predictably, because it's sugar and there's lots of calories in it, would create this huge pleasure response in the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and some other linked up areas. As these monkeys continued to engage in these activities, where they would walk into a lab, do an activity, and then have this reward response, eventually would start with start to happen is they would see the activity, they'd, they'd pursue it, and the first second they'd get engaged in the activity, they would start having their brain kind of react in that pleasurable response, go into overdrive, even before they got the reward, that in this case juice, for the activity itself. And it eventually led to these animals not only producing a pleasure response when they were doing the activity, but when they were given the opportunity to pursue that activity, to get close to just the, the, the computer screen that would allow them to engage in the activity that would eventually lead them to getting the reward. And this is believed by many neuroscientists and clinical psychologists to be the main catalyst for lots of problems in individuals who have substance use issues. They become not just addicted to the drugs, but to the environment and to help them overcome their addiction to the drugs. What you often have to do is try to find a way to sort of remove the environment and the actions from these individuals' repertoires. Otherwise, it's, it's very easy to go back down this path because of how set the brain is in trying to find this routine and, and get this or derive this reward system within it. And this is just one of the many things that researchers have started to look at when it comes to trying to find ways to help people that have gone down the path of having substance use issues. Unfortunately, what we've encountered when looking at this is that the systems, the issues that pop up for substance abuse concerns, 
to vary dramatically from drug classification to drug classification. Now, historically, in this class, I would break down the different types of drug uses that are out there and, and how different treatments work. I decided this semester with my graduate students that I worked with to develop this class that we'd kind of go away from that and focus more just on defining this disorder as a whole. But for those of you that are recognizing that you or somebody you know might have some type of issue relating to substance abuse, I did want to close out this lecture with a slide that talks about several options that are available and have proven to be very effective for people with different types of addiction issues. And just kind of being aware of these things and that the problem surrounding it, I believe, is, is a really important thing as we're wrapping up this class and as we're starting to take stock of how so many of the things that we're covering might be components in not only our life, but maybe the lives of others around us. Now, as I mentioned that, though, it is also really critically important to remind everybody that as we're finishing up this module, you are not a clinical psychologist still. Right? It takes many years for people to get trained on these topics. So knowing about these types of options could be food for thought, could be informative, especially if you think you might have issues relating to any of the disorders or types of problems that we've talked about. But we really do not want you, after finishing this class and this module, to think of yourself as a clinical psychologist and try to start utilizing this techniques, not only for yourself, but for others around you. So if you can be very cautious with that and mindful of that, the hope is that all of this information can be very useful just in general and can sort of help you as you navigate through life. And again, this is true for pretty much every topic that we've discussed in the class. And with those closing words, believe it or not, I kind of flew through this lecture, but um, we're at the end. So I greatly appreciate all the effort many of you have been putting in throughout this entire class. I hope you got a lot out of things. And I, I wish you the best of luck as we're kind of rounding the corner and getting to the very last few things. I uh, guess the last thing I can say is take care and I hope to see you soon. Bye, everybody.